everybody. Uh, thank you very much indeed for choosing this session. I hope despite everything that you are well. Uh, my name is Chris and this session is called Growing Great Teachers, Improve not prove. Now, I have two jobs. Um, I work for half the week as a freelance consultant. I work in schools all over the country. In fact, I've worked in about 700 different schools now. And the other half of the week, I work as head of staff development for a multi-academy trust in Somerset. We've got eight schools and across the whole age range of three to 19. And I work with the staff predominantly in their classrooms. Now, I was a senior leader at uh, one of the schools and I left in 2017, but returned to work for the trust in 2018 as head of staff development. One of the first conversations I had with our CEO was about performance management. Now, performance management came out in 2001. I think it was updated in England and in Wales in about 2012. And one of the conversations I had with my CEO, he, he said, Chris, it, it, performance management, is that a waste of time? I said, well, I think it is, Peter. And I've got to remember with him, actually, and if ever you say anything's bad, you know you're going to get a job. And I got the job of, of rewriting a policy for uh, a replacement for performance management. So we have uh, laid to rest performance management. It's gone. We no longer have it. In fact, what we don't have anymore is imposed targets or data targets, or that delayed look back that might happen in October when we look back at the previous year. And the trouble with that system is that we've had August in between and we can't remember what happened last year if we've done anything at all towards those performance management targets. So we've got rid of those. We've also got rid of high stakes uh, lesson observations. Now, not many of our schools had those high stakes one. In fact, the school where I was a senior leader, we got rid of grades 10 years ago, but we have had hierarchical lesson observations. And I wanted to get rid of that as well. I just wanted everyone to receive feedback, but I didn't really care who it came from. So I wanted to get rid of that hierarchy. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of this replacement for performance management and, and how it kind of how it looks over the year. I wanted to move from um, an annual process to something that was just always ongoing. I wanted to move away from a one size fits all approach, which performance management in my eyes always used to be to a one size fits one because people are different. Their experiences are different. Their knowledge bases are different. Uh, their age groups are different. What they need to develop is different. So one size fits one. I wanted to move away from just reflecting always on the past and start to think about what we could do in the future, the solutions to the problems that we face as a teacher, rather than thinking a lot about what we've done in the past. I wanted to move away from a hierarchical kind of uh, approach to improving somebody to something that was just collaborative. It didn't matter who you worked alongside as long as you worked alongside somebody. I wanted uh, senior leadership teams to stop talking about their staff and start talking with their staff. And I wanted the focus very much to be on improving rather than trying to constantly prove ourselves, which is a real problem in, in education. So what we have um, over the whole year is um, we have a professional growth plan that people um, compose at the start. At the end of the process, they do um, a review and they share uh, what they've been focusing on. And in between, they receive frequent regular feedback and also have regular check ins with their teams and their line manager. We also have a couple of other features to this. We have um, an automatic pay rise. And I use that term fairly loosely, actually, because um, it's not necessarily automatic. You have to maintain the standards of which you qualify, the teacher's standards, which, you know, most teachers do. And the other thing you have to do is engage in the process of professional growth. So if you devise a plan, seek feedback report back regularly and share at the end of the, the process, then your pay rise is automatic. And we also have within our trust accelerated upper pay range. That is, you can apply for upper pay range after two years in the job. Now, um, I'll make an assumption about lots of you. I, I presume quite a few of you drive. And I know we're not really driving very much at the moment, but just think about the last time that you did drive. Now, I don't necessarily want you to think about your journey. I want you to think about your driving. What was it like? What was your um, use of your mirrors or your signalling 
or your hazard awareness? How were you when you approached a roundabout? What did you look out for? What was your lane discipline like? What were the hazards that were around you? What was your speed like? And the chances are you won't be able to remember. And the reason you won't be able to remember is because you've mastered the basics of this, this task. And you've pretty much within obviously safety um, uh, considerations gone into autopilot. So you've reached something called the OK plateau. You've mastered the basics of a task and you've basically gone into autopilot. Now, what's interesting is that there are several professions that can fall into that trap too. And in fact, one bit of research from 2004 suggests this. So our ability to impact on children actually plateaus after the first um, three to five years. And we all know that when we're first in teaching, our learning curve is incredibly steep and then does probably flatline a little bit as a result of us going on to autopilot. Now, this piece of research suggests that actually, if you operate in a school that uh, would be seen as a more supportive professional environment, then maybe that plateau doesn't occur in the same way. So an obvious question for you, maybe just to pause the video or just to consider now, is a more supportive professional environment. What might that look like at its best? And how close is your organization to achieving that particular goal? And when we devised this uh, new process, we were thinking all the time about what would this supportive professional environment really look like? Pause if you want to have a think about it, otherwise we'll move on. Now, here's a guy who's got um, understandably a very poor press recently, which I'm, I'm delighted about because he's he's done some things that uh, are just not right. However, when we were devising this, there's a quote that's attributed to Richard Branson, which is really interesting given uh, his current decisions. Uh, it's something along the lines of you, you train people well enough uh, so they can move on, but you treat them well enough so they want to stay. Now, that's going to come back and bite him on the arse, isn't it? However, when we were devising this process, I very much had that idea in mind. I wanted people within our trust to be trained well enough and developed as professionals enough to make the next move on in their careers. Because the long and short of it was I didn't really care where people taught as long as they stayed in teaching. But I wanted to make sure that we had within our schools a culture and, uh, and a way of working that really encouraged people to, to stay with us. So this process, yes, it is about staff development and yes, it is about school improvement, but it's also about recruitment and retention and well-being. It's also about looking after people. It's about developing their skills and hoping that they'll stay with our trust and, and become even better than they are already. Now, here's a whole host of different people, different organizations, different publications uh, that really influenced my thinking when I rewrote performance management in the guise of growing great teachers. I'll give you a moment just to have a glance at that slide and see if there's any you recognize. I'm sure there are. Person down in the uh, bottom right hand is uh, a woman called Sheila Heen, who wrote the book Above Her called Thanks for the Feedback, which is astonishingly good and has really influenced my practice. The guy next to her who wrote the book Peak is Anders Ericsson. And uh, a lot of his work has also influenced my thinking in terms of how we try and get even better. And the other two people um, in the very early days of putting this um, policy together really did influence my thinking. The guy in um, to the left hand side of Anders Ericsson is Daniel Pink, who wrote the book uh, Drive. And next to him, Heidi Grant Halverson. Now, Dan Pink, in his book Drive, referred to the three things that really motivate people, purpose, autonomy and mastery. And I wanted um, this policy very much to have those three things in mind. I wanted the policy that we have to have a very clear purpose. And each person 
with had a purpose that they had some sense of control over. Now, I don't think we can necessarily be autonomous, truly autonomous in such an accountable kind of world that we we operate in. However, I wanted people to have a sense of choice over what they decided to work on. And I wanted them to do that thing for long enough that they became really good at it. Because a, a criticism I often had of, of CPD when I was a teacher is it felt quite scattergun. It felt quite um, it changed a lot. We did a term of this. We did a term of something else. And we never did anything long enough to get really good at it. So those three things really influenced the way that I wanted to put together this um, particular process. And I wanted and, and the improve, not prove idea comes from uh, Heidi Grant Halverson, who said, actually, if you do want to be if you do want to succeed, then focus on getting better as opposed to being good. And I think in education, quite often, we're often seeking the badge of being good or being outstanding or whatever it might be. And actually what we should be doing if we really want to succeed is trying to get better. Now, this is the hallmark of many great organizations. One of them on, the, on that uh, initial slide with all the different images on were the All Blacks. And they have a mantra that the, for them, the challenge is to always improve, to always get better, even when you're the best. Actually, especially when you're the best. Um, in Honda and in Toyota, they call this Kaizen change for the better, change for the good. It's almost daily improvement. And I think in Amazon, I think they've got something called day one. We're just getting started. It's the first day of the internet. How are we gonna get even better? So they're constantly trying to, to, to improve. And that's the hallmark of elite organizations and elite businesses and elite teams. Now, when I started to investigate uh, alternatives to performance management, I discovered some similarities between some major companies. Now, you probably recognize all the names of the companies that are currently on the screen. And the interesting thing about those is that at some point in their existence, they've all had performance management. But recently they have binned it and replaced it with much more ongoing coaching and mentoring. In fact, Accenture did um, a, a survey and quite a, actually quite a big study around performance management, and they discovered this from their survey. Give you a moment to read those. So lots of organisations are or have think are thinking about or have changed their performance management arrangements because the majority of their employees don't rate it as a process. Now, a document that um, had a big impact on me came from an organization uh, called Accenture, a global marketing company, uh, and they talk about how to achieve before, um, high performance. And when I read um, this particular list, it was kind of a light bulb moment because for me, this is exactly what I wanted our policy to have. Take a look at this. So when I read that, I thought that's what I want it to look like. That's what I want our process to be. And that's where our policy, our replacement for performance management really stemmed from, from what the business world were doing, what elite teams were doing, what elite organizations were doing. And we called that growing great teachers. And very much for us, the mantra is to improve, not prove. We don't want our teachers to be proving how brilliant they are. We know they're brilliant, but we want them to get better on a daily basis if they can be forever learning. So the question really for you maybe to think of, not necessarily now, but another time is in your school, in your organization, where is your focus? Is it on proving or improving? And can we flip that? Can we start to think about how our staff could improve their, their practice rather than constantly be demanded of them that they have to try and prove? Now, um, I, I love gymnastics uh, and here is um, 
a double world champion. This is Max Whitlock. He's an uh, Olympic champion, I think, as well, but certainly double world champion on the pommel horse. And when you see somebody who's operating at this standard, I mean, this is astonishingly good. And when you watch someone like that, sometimes you forget the hours of practice and strength and conditioning that go into being this good at something. You don't see that. You see the, the end performance, which we'll finish watching. Just amazing. What a performer. You know, when you go to a cinema and you see someone's uh, performance that's so convincing, uh, the accent is is just so perfect that you, you think this person is this person. What you don't realize is that it took her a year to perfect that accent, so much so that I think even her daughter started adopting that way of talking. When you go into someone's classroom and their teaching is absolutely effortless, what you don't see is in this case uh, the hours of marking but also the the thinking that goes into that the 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 way that they plan the lessons around who they're going to interact with the kind of culture they set up in their classroom when you're not looking the small interactions around the school where you build relationships and trust so for example the lads at the back of this class know that they'll get their turn with this teacher and they keep focus throughout the time where they haven't got her attention because they respect her because she's invested in that time what you see when you see high performers is you see the tip of the iceberg and what Anders Ericsson called the iceberg illusion what I'm really interested in is what happens beneath the surface, because the outcomes and performance are something you see. But beneath the surface is really where I think a genuinely continuous professional development happens. That's where professional growth occurs. What you choose to do when no one's watching and the door shut and it's just you and the children. That for me is where professional growth truly happens. It doesn't happen in a hall or even on a, a research ed gig. It happens when you're on your own and you've got an opportunity to practice with the children in front of you. So one of the things that we did um, very early on is try to establish some sort of principles behind what we call, called genuinely continuous CPD, so professional growth. So, um, the, the sorts of things that you would do every day, the sorts of things that made a difference and not necessarily, as I said, not just being in a hall occasionally and listening to uh, old geezers like me talk, actually what you chose to do. And these were the principles that uh, we devised that we thought uh, represented effective and generally continuous professional growth. I'll give you just a moment or so just to scan over those and just reflect on um, whether or not your school, your organisation, has those at the heart of its CPD arrangements. Several I want to, to draw upon, actually. The first one is about doing the right thing when no one is looking. So here we have um, something that could be described as ugly, but effective. It's very much about function over form. It was designed by um, uh, this person. Her name is Ray Eames. And Ray Eames said this. So it's not about looking good. It's about doing things that work because that lasts. And so what we uh, kind of hope that people would focus on during uh, their time of trying to get better is on what works. That is, we what we ask of people is that they choose one narrow yet significant focus, that what they also do is they sustain that focus over time until such time that they almost can't not do it. Because for me, um, Excellence is, is a process of evolution. It's a process of incremental learning, of cumulative gains. It takes place over quite a considerable amount of time. Now, uh, I know I've shared this with lots of people in the past, actually, if you've ever been to anything I've ever done. This is um, 
a sporting hero of mine. His name is Sergei Bubka. He's a Ukrainian athlete who, who broke the world record 35 times. I think it was 18 indoors and, and 17 outdoors. And you can see by the numbers down the side of the screen there that actually when he broke the world record, he did so only by um, small uh, margins every time. Now, if we take the red bar, the red bar is you at your worst. And I'm going to make an assumption about every single person here that you've all taught a car crash of a lesson. Of course you have. You know, we're humans. Uh, when we're at our best, we're at the at the green line and somewhere in between is our comfort zone. That's the OK plateau. That's where we've mastered the basics of the task. And we're we're just basically tripping along. What I want people to to do is have the aspiration of um, Z of this amazing world-class performance, but be thinking about getting there in terms of small little steps. So our first step is just A. What would A look like? A small step that says, I've got started with this. And then when A becomes part of us and we can't not do it, then what's the next step and the next step? And what we do is we edge towards being that brilliant um, at whatever we focus on. I call these plus ones, and I think these small little plus ones can help us avoid that that plateau and and actually lead to some fairly genuinely continuous professional growth. But our mastery curve very much looks more like this: a series of blips and plateaus. The plateaus are when we're consolidating or just forgetting about it or or just practicing, and then we go again. But what we don't do is we don't lower our bar. We keep that bar high, but we just nudge up small amounts every single time. So what we ask people to do is, is choose a narrow yet significant focus. So in September, October time, they reflect and plan in the interim. They practice. They receive feedback. They, they undertake check ins with their colleagues and they basically experiment with ideas. And then in June, although it was obviously curtailed or going to be curtailed this year, they review what they've done over the year and they share their findings with their colleagues. At the start of the year, we ask people to reflect on the teacher standards. This is a document that's uh, private. Uh, it doesn't have to go to anybody. It's just a way of reflecting. So I don't I could take it to the meeting I have with my line manager, um, but it's not essential. It's just a way of reflecting on where I am. We ask people to scale themselves. There's no um, uh, objective measure here. It's just a subjective way of you thinking where you are on a scale of I'm really poor at this too. I've nailed it. Where would you, you where are you at currently? And most importantly, what would you have to do to be one step higher up the scale? And potentially that narrow yet significant focus may well come from that reflection on the teacher standards. We ask people to focus on, and I call it optimizing typicality. We ask people to focus on and change something that they do every day. I'm interested only in what happens between the bells. What do people choose to do during that time? That's what they should be focusing on. They draw up um, that focus on something that we call professional growth plan. Um, it's very much got autonomy, purpose, autonomy and mastery at its heart, a very clear purpose a sense of choice, although we do ask people to work within the parameters of school development plans, subject development plans, phase development plans, of course. Um, and we ask people to sustain their um, focus on this for long enough that they actually achieve uh, their goal, hopefully. Um, it's also based on the GROW model of coaching, the goal, reality, options and what next. It ends up looking something like that, probably at two sides at the absolute maximum. All of these documents, by the way, are on my website. I have a, a blog. It's not a huge amount on it, but this is on it. It's chrismoys.wordpress.com. And I'll, I'll put that link up at the end of this presentation. What we ask people to do at the end of that professional growth plan is just summarize their goals. So here's an example. So by June 2020. I'm um, live modeling writing so that my students know what success looks like and can work more independently. The success isn't down to achieving this goal. It's engaging in the process. So if you got to Christmas and you think, actually, this is not what I need to do, change it. If you get to Christmas and you think, actually, I've nailed this already, change it. That's fine. It's your engagement in the process, not your achievement.
So once you've set up this plan, the idea is to experiment, it's to reflect fairly regularly, and it's to practice your ideas. Um, I know that um, the the CEO of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, he, he talks about success at Amazon and he says it's actually down to how many experiments they do every single day, every week, every month over the years. Um, this fella, Eduardo Brasinho, he talks about um, people, uh, experts in any domain operating between two zones. Um, he said, if you stay in your performance zone too much, ironically, that affects your performance, because in a performance zone, what you're trying to do is eliminate mistakes. You're trying to um, undertake tasks that you've already mastered. Now, he said what experts do is they come out of that performance zone into a zone that he calls a learning zone where you're trying things out that actually may not go right. Some things where uh, mistakes are expected, where feedback is really necessary. And what you learn from that, you can put back into your performance zone. So where does the emphasis lie in your school? In terms of when you go into someone's classroom, is it about them performing or is it about them learning? Because when I go into someone's classroom, I don't want to see them necessarily show me the skills they've already mastered. I want to work alongside them, helping them um, with their very, very small next step up, up that ladder. I want our staff to engage in something that Anders Ericsson calls purposeful practice. And, and purposeful practice for me has these um four features. It has a clearly defined goal, not goals, a goal, one thing that you're doing. That one thing is just out of your comfort zone. It's out of your OK plateau. Um, uh, it's something that's going to make you think. It might make you sweat a little bit, but it's certainly going to make you think. I want you to relentlessly focus on that until you start really moving forwards with it. But really importantly, it's about getting feedback. Now, feedback is an essential part of our process growing great teachers. And we talk about professional support. It doesn't necessarily just have to be feedback. It could be observation. It could be analysis. It could be mentoring and coaching. It could be just you planning with somebody else. It, it could be you having a conversation with somebody that sparks a thought that 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 sets you on your way to, to your next step. But we do need to think carefully about what the purpose of lesson observation is. Now, in my head, the, the reason I would go into someone's classroom is to help them get better or to learn from them. It would never be to judge them. If you are working in a school with a person, lesson, lesson observation is to judge the quality of teaching, then just think twice about that because it's very hard to judge teachers. And what you will be judging is their performance zone. And if you always judge people in their performance zone, then they won't perform better. So it's important to have lesson observation as a developmental process, I think. And they're the two reasons, as I said, I would go into a lesson. So for me, feedback, I think it should be more frequently. If you're doing it three times a year, it probably make no difference at all. In the early stages, I think it's important to go in really frequently. So it may be that it's better to go into some, see somebody uh, four times in a month, but just 10 minutes each time than it would be to go in for 40 minutes every month. Um, I think it should be with a greater focus. So when you go into someone's classroom, they've been practicing something and the focus of your feedback and your attention is completely on the thing that they've been practicing. So they will set the parameters in terms of what they want you to focus on. And when you do meet them to discuss the next steps, what you think about, although you use what they did as a reality check, what you do think about is what they're going to do next to really improve. But I think if we genuinely want to make feedback a, a, a much better process, for me, it's a make, making it non-hierarchical and something I'm trialing in two of our schools. Um, they're both middle schools and they have TAs working there as lots of sort of primary and middle school settings do. And those TAs are quite regularly in classrooms. And one of the things we're trialing is TAs giving their teachers feedback. I want to make it non-hierarchical because I think that potentially could make it much more acceptable. And what we have to do when we give feedback is acknowledge that people are different. We have this idea that one size fits one. So how you give feedback to one person is not how you give it to another person, because some people like it face to face. Some people like it as close to the event as possible. 
Other people like it written down so they've got time to process it before they meet you because it may take them some time to maybe get over a, a tough message or just to process the information that you're providing for them. So one size fits one. In fact, in one of my schools, I've encouraged them to share their focus. Um, and actually, I didn't expect them to put it on their door. Um, but this whole idea is that whenever you go into someone's classroom, regardless of whether you know what their focus is or not, you could see that they've got a little sign up there that asks for particular uh, feedback on something. And in fact, on this one, it easily says email me after. So this person would like it on email first before they meet with you to discuss their next steps. Give them time to process uh, what you've written and, and what they think they might want to do next. Um, one company that certainly influenced my thinking was Gap. And, uh, and Gap, um, on the trading stocks and shares market, their trading name, I think, is GPS. And their version of performance management um, is called GPS. And it's an acronym for Grow, Perform, Succeed. And it works along the idea of kind of a sat-nav idea. That is, um, the idea of their uh, coaching and mentoring uh, and performance management as such is to put you back on track towards the goal you want to achieve. So I very much took that idea into what we do together with what Adobe do on a monthly basis with their colleagues is having a regular check in. So we combine those two things for what we call check ins that sometimes are done individually, but more often than not done at team meetings. So I might have the, you know, my maths team all around the table and in turn we'll go around and just check in to see how people are progressing with their particular professional growth plan. Opportunity for accountability, of course, but it's also an opportunity to, to share with colleagues what they've been doing. I give the middle leaders a script. Uh, this is the script that I do. So um, as they work around the table, they'll say, you know, I know, Chris, what's your current focus? How's your plan going? What's going well? What have you been trialing? You know, what else have you been doing? What have you learned from feedback? Um, you know, what else uh, might you try to develop? How can I help? So each person will will know what questions are coming and, and can prepare for that meeting. But it also gives uh, a sense of parity um, as well at that particular sharing check in. And at the end of the year, they will review and share. We ask people to write a one page summary, which becomes a public document so people can find them on their central drive and see what people have done previously and learn from them. But we also ask them to present it to colleagues and they have to respond on that one page summary and in their presentation to these five questions. I'll give you a moment just to read those. Again, all of these documents are on my website. Success in this process is very much down to your engagement in the process, not your achievement of a goal. And actually linking it back to teacher standards, there are several teacher standards which we ask our staff, of course, like all schools, to adhere to. And these ones that you can see on the screen now very much link into the performance management and our replacement for that process, Growing Great Teachers. This is our expectation of our colleagues throughout the year. So what we ask for uh, people is, is for them, as Jocelyn Gly said, put yourself in permanent beta mode, always looking to improve, always looking to get better. Uh, the late um, CEO of Body Shop, Anita Roddick, says, if you do things well, do them better. Mayor Angelou said this. So for me, this process is one of getting better, not being good. It's about improving, not proving. There's a summary. There's my website. There's also my Twitter handle and also uh, my email if you want to get in contact and discuss further. If I can help your school, then that would be great. And if you found that interesting, that's also great. So thank you for very much for choosing uh, this presentation. Um, in the current climate, stay safe, look after each other, look out for each other. And, and just a personal thank you, actually, to all the teachers there. I, I'm no longer a teacher. I was for 18 years and I was a senior leader uh, on top of those 18 years for seven years. But I work with teachers every single day 
usually in their classrooms. And I'm in awe of them as a group of people. And I think as a profession, each and every one of you are absolutely amazing. So thank you very much. You know, I'm in those dark times and, and maybe some of those are at the moment. Just hang on to the thought that what you do as a teacher is that you change lives. And and uh, and I think that's just such a laudable reason to stay in the profession. Thank you very much and um, have a fantastic day. Cheers.